Welcome back for part two of our episode and our interview with Margot Adler, author of Drawing Down the Moon. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Reverend Don Lewis, and we're here at PantheaCon, still, and we're here with the great Margot Adler. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, great, I don't know, but Margot Adler, yes. <laughs> I think most people pe- most people would agree with the, that that um, that categorization for well, you. Thank you. Uh, your book, Drawing Down the Moon, was a tremendous landmark in our community, and I can remember when it came out and what it did for people, at least in my part of the world, which is Illinois and the Midwest. So it really reinforced our sense of community and not being alone. And I'd like to take this moment to thank you for that, and I'm sure that many other people have have already, but there are probably more people than you know who are grateful for that. You know, I get, I, you know, I would get letters all the time, and they would always be almost the same kind of thing, you know. I found this book in my local public library in this small town or whatever, and until I read this book, I thought I was the only pagan. I thought I was completely alone, and I now know there are others like me. Thank you, you know. And that it's was, true. I think, was the, the real power of, of, of the book in the beginning. And, and that's what makes you the great Margot Adler. Thank you. Um, now, you were saying that, that the anniversary edition is coming out of Drawing Down the Moon. Um, I don't know if it's anniversary. Well, no, no, no. I, um, what I, we, we put out um, the, what, what I would call, we put out a, a new edition. The it new was edition. A couple of, uh, it came out about a year ago. It came out about a year ago. And what had happened was this, that I had, the book originally came out a long time ago. It originally came out the same day on the same coast, I mean on the opposite coast, on the same day as Starhawk's The Spiral Dance, and that was basically Halloween 1971, All Hallows' Eve 1979. Well, probably not in the evening, given the, you know, but anyway, <laughs> it was October 31st, 1979. And um, then there were revisions. The main revision was around 86, um, mm-hmm. and then there was another revision just of the resource guide, which was in 97. And then, um, you know, I went, I went about my life. I went back to my life. I sort of forgot about things, and almost like Rip Van Winkle, I, um, you know, I, sort of the pagan movement passed me by for a while, and I uh, suddenly woke up, and suddenly someone said, you know, you have to rev- do a revision, and it was like, oh my God, it's changed so much, and so I put in the new edition, um, has about 150 new pages, and mm-hmm. has a completely new resource guide, but also has a lot of sections in which I revisit where are you know where are festivals now? What happened to the women's spirituality movement? What happened to gay paganism? What happened to you know how, added all kinds of traditions that hadn't even been mentioned that I'd never heard about? Mm-hmm. You know, I'd never heard about was it 1734? I'd never heard. I mean, there were all kinds of traditions I'd never even heard of you know 20 mm-hmm. years ago that now were suddenly in there and so forth. I would, I would imagine that was a wonderful experience for oh. you. Well, you know, I only I had a very limited time because, uh, mm-hmm. unlo- but luckily I had the internet, which I didn't have before. So it was a, I was able. First of all, I took all the the names of all the groups that I had in my resource guide in '97, and I wrote letters out to them saying, um, you know, where are you? What's happened? Here's what your old listing looked like. Uh, you know. Half of them came back with, you know, no longer here, address unknown, etc. But then luckily I thought, at first I got very discouraged. And then I, um, well, suppose I take the same organization and I Google it. So, for example, I'll give you a funny example. There was one of my groups in the, in the, in the resource guide, which was the Toronto Pub Moot. It was a pub pagan meeting. That was uh, every whatever, every month or whatever in this pub in Toronto. And so when I sent the letter there, a letter came back, nowhere, no what. I Googled it, and not only did the Toronto pub moop exist, there were 11 other pagan <laughs> pub moops in Canada. Wonderful. That were, you know, and so that was what kept on happening. Yeah. And, and suddenly, and so this movement, which I had sort of described as, Oh, a couple hundred thousand people. Suddenly I went to adherence.com and I looked up and it said, Paganism, 19th most popular religion worldwide, one million adherents. And then I saw all these scholarly people and, you know, saying there were 5,000 websites in 2001 and there were 750,000 pagans in the United States. And there were, you know, suddenly every, and I suddenly realized that the festivals I had gone to in the 80s that had 500 people had 1,000 people. And some mm-hmm. of the ones that had 1,000 people were like this, Fantheacon yeah. with 2,500 
300 people here. Um, and so suddenly I realized there was this huge change in this movement and uh, a lot of other changes that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that was going to be my question because you, you must have seen so many changes. And other than the size, what do you think is the most significant change? Well, I think that we have become a world religion with all that that entails. And that means that we, paganism is now, you know, when I first came in, it was a very young movement. It was, uh, uh, you know, very rebellious, kind of 60s-ish, et cetera. Now we have, not only do we have families and elders and charities and pagan studies and peer-reviewed pagan magazines and prison chaplains and, you know, the beginning to perhaps soon have military chaplains and have military pagans and the Pentacle Quest and Pentacles on Gravestones in Arlington Cemetery. I mean, so we, you know, chair, there's suddenly, uh, I would say, so that's the first thing, that we have become a world religion. And that means that many of the things that every other religion in the world has, we are beginning to have. And we have more, um, so that we are, um, uh, we are now, you know, we have, um, teen tracks and children tracks at, at festivals, we now have um, people beginning to talk about old age and paganism and what mm. does that mean and what is, uh, you know, what is it now? Festivals beginning to say, well, maybe we should go into hotels because we have to deal with people who are not able-bodied anymore. I mean, there are we, all we kinds a of, lot of issues with a that. lot of issues coming up that we never considered before. Mm -hmm. um, pagan pride, the idea that there are you know, hundreds of groups celebrating pagan pride in the one in New York, there's a blood mobile and it basically takes yeah. blood and there are, you know, so I mean, I think that's the major thing that we have become this, I mean, I wouldn't call us kind of mainstream in the, totally because we still have this sort of rebellious core and we do have a perspective that is very much different than the uh, monotheistic religions that are around and so forth. But I do think that we have really come of age in a, in a very significant way. Um, of all the people that I interview, you're one of the most appropriate for my next question, although I ask almost everybody. What do, you th what do you think is the most important thing that we need in the future in our community? Or need in the present? Well, I think that the Pinnacle Quest was a very interesting thing because what happened was we approached it, the people who fought the battles fought it in a very different way than all other pagan battles have been fought. If you think about it, we, the people who fought it did not say, oh, we've been victims, oh, we've been persecuted. No, 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 no. They said, well, what are the rules that we have to fly under? Well, we have to find... We have to find a military family who has lost someone. We have to go through this rope. We have to go through that. We have to approach it as if we are entitled, as anybody else is entitled, and we have, and not that we are sort of, oh, these persecuted victims. So we came at it in a much more mature fashion and fought the fight in a very different way. Mm. And I think that's why... Uh, there was such a success and I think that's a lesson to learn in the way we go about a lot of other battles that we need to go about. Yes indeed. Uh, you mentioned your, your memoir, oh, Heretic yes. Heart. Um, would you care, care to address that? Well, um, I was trying to figure out a way to write about my past, which had included a lot of politics in the 60s and growing up in sort of a red diaper baby family and uh, going to Berkeley and being arrested in the free speech movement and being a civil rights worker in Mississippi and going to Cuba and all this kind of thing. And so I wrote this book as a way of sort of explaining how I moved from this very political, almost rationalistic you know, agnostic atheist world into sort of the world of spirituality. There's not that much spirituality in the book, but it's a movement toward it. So mm -hmm. that it starts out as a very sort of political book, and, and I think there's a lot of powerful stuff in it, but it moves toward the end, as you see, I be start talking about 
how I really began to embrace a pagan perspective. And so it's sort of that journey. Um, that's why I call it a, um, a journey from spirit to, re you, know, from, from, you know, sort of sp from spirit to revolution or from revolution to spirit or whatever I call it. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, if people would like to learn more about you uh, or buy your books, uh, where would you send them? Oh, you know, I think that they can get my books anywhere. You know, That's you true. can order at any store or whatever, and you can just ask for Drawing Down the Moon, and you can ask for uh, Heretic's Heart, and they can order it for you. Um, there are a number of my essays on BeliefNet. So if they go to BeliefNet, they can look me up and read some of my essays. Um, and you can come to festivals and hear me chant and sing because I love, one of the things I love to do is not only give workshops where I talk about the stuff, I love to chant and sing and I give workshops. And, oh, yeah. We were, we were just talking in a previous interview about the importance of music oh. in the pagan movement. And you know, in the beginning, when I got into the pagan movement in the beginning, there was no music. Mm -hmm. There was no music. As a matter of fact, the first group that I belonged to the idea of what a ritual was, was you'd put Carmina Burana on the sort of record player, <laughs> and people would kind of sort of stomp around, and then someone would sort of say, stop, and then, <laughs> and then you sort of put your hands out, and you were sort of doing magic. It was really ridiculous. Well, um... It was really ridiculous. And what has happened is, well, there's a huge, this is a whole long other story, but yes. Music started coming into the pagan movement, and the festival phenomenon that started in the late 70s really created a national pagan culture by having this huge number of songs and chants that went from coast to coast so that everybody knew the same songs and chants. And suddenly, rituals became much more powerful. They became much more magical. They became much more ritually adept because of all the music and also because of some of the ecstatic techniques that yes. people were learning, dancing around the bonfire, et cetera, that happened in these festivals. What's interesting now, dropping my pen, what's interesting now is that now the festivals are so big that this shared culture is breaking apart a little bit. There are so many chants now that you can't know the That's same chants. You can't know the same music because there are so many CDs, there are so many albums, etc. And what's happened is some of the festivals are so big that there are many cultures within the festival. So you have the people who go to the drum circles and then you have the people who go to the community stuff and, and, and not always those same people meet. So we're, one of the issues that's coming up I think now is that we're broadening as a movement and we're becoming more diverse and the question is how are we going to hold together as a movement I don't think we've completely figured that one out and the other thing that I think has changed and this was of all the things I thought uh, learned through the research I did on this book um, this is the one that sort of struck with me when I became involved in the craft in the very beginning well first of all the craft that you joined was whatever happened to be in the neighborhood Mm. You know, it wasn't necessarily the group that you wanted to be in. It wasn't necessarily the tradition that you really felt mm. akin to. You know, if you had a Gardnerian group in your neighborhood, but you were into Druids, you became a Gardnerian because there were no Druids around. So for me, I ended up that way. Uh, I would have probably, if I had my druthers, become a Greco-Roman pagan. That was where my heart was in the beginning, but mm. there was no such group around. So... Um, so what happened, I think, is that now, um, then what would happen, okay, so you'd be in these groups, and some of them were very authoritarian, some of them were very messed up, some of them were just what happened to be in the neighborhood, and then the festival phenomenon happened, and suddenly you would go to these festivals, and you'd see five different rituals, of five different traditions in five days and suddenly your head exploded and you suddenly said, oh, I really want to be uh, blah, 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 you know, and then you'd suddenly hook up with some group or you'd hook up with someone else and that's what happened. Now I think it's very different. You come to paganism through a festival, through the internet, through something like that. You experience this fabulous festival phenomenon. You come to Pantheacon. You come somewhere else. And then about a year later, you suddenly go, you know, I want to go deeper. 
So suddenly you then find the coven, the grove, the kindred. You know, whereas before you found that and it was too, it was sort of too confining and then you went outward, now you start outward and you go inward because you suddenly want the training, you want the deepening, you want the et cetera. And so that's what happens now. So I think that that's, there's been like a reverse sort of pathway, that the pathway into the craft and into Wicca and into paganism has changed. And the other thing that's happened is you now have some national organizations that are big, like Circle, Earth Spirit, Lady Liberty League, COG, et cetera. Well, COG's really more coven, so it's not quite the same. And there are people who join those organizations nationally and never go in through the coven mm -hmm. road or the Grove Road or whatever. That's a big change. Those are big changes. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for taking this time with us. Oh. And is there anything else that you would like to mention while, while we're here? Yes, one thing. I'll give you my newbie pagan rap, which, uh, which I always like to say because I love this to say this. What I tell people if I'm giving a lecture to people who are new, who really have never thought about paganism at all, I say to them, you know, you may not realize this, but if you go far enough back, all of your ancestors were pagans. And particularly in this country, there are three routes that you probably came here, but this is the truth. If you're black, your traditions were stolen from you through slavery. And if you're Native American, most of your traditions were taken from you through colonialism. And if you're white, most of your traditions were taken from you because your great-great-grandparents or your great-grandparents wanted to assimilate so fast that they basically threw out all the traditions. So the truth is, is if you're sitting here in the United States of America, no matter who you are, you don't have the songs, you don't have the lullabies, you don't have the creation myths, you don't have the coming-of-age ceremonies, you don't have all the things that, in fact, every indigenous culture has. And what this is all about, what Wicca, paganism, all of this is about, is trying to find, for us, who are bereft, who are searching through the ashes. Essentially, we want a rich, juicy, vibrant, earth-based tradition to give us the sustenance we need at the same time that we want to live in the modern world with integrity. We want to dance around a bonfire at night and have ecstatic traditions and get up the next morning and still be able to be a doctor or a computer programmer or whatever we want. And what we're trying to do with all of these traditions is we are trying to create a modern, vibrant way of having the best that the old indigenous traditions had for all people and yet have a way of living in the modern world. And that's essentially what this journey is really about. Thank you very much. I hope that you enjoyed this week's episode and that you'll join us again next week for another episode of Living the Wiccan Life. As for us, we'll be in New York City next week. And on Thursday, April 3rd, we'll be attending the world premiere of Hoopston, a documentary about a small town and a big school for witches. Until next week, may you blessed be. Hello, this is Reverend Don Lewis, and I'm very pleased to announce the publication in paperback of Witch School's Lessons for the First Degree, available now for pre-order from witchschool.com and coming soon to a bookstore near you together with Lessons for the Second Degree and Lessons for the Third Degree.